Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Pig Health Today, and with me is Dr. Scott D. from Pipestone Veterinary Services in Pipestone, Minnesota. Great to see you as always. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the opportunity to meet with you again. You bet. Um, now, lots of people think of PERS when they think of Scott D. Um, you've been doing a lot of work with the disease for more than 20 years, as I recall. Uh, it's, it's a viral disease, but it's always accompanied by bacterial infections, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great, uh, a great virus. It knocks out the immune system and it allows a lot of the bacteria that are normally present in the pig and doing no harm to the pig. They've got to jump in on a compromised respiratory tract, for example, and just gets down in the lungs and causes all sorts of trouble. So yeah, it, it opens the door for a lot of secondary pathogens to cause problems. And, and then what's generally the attack plan when you have these secondary pathogens? Oh, you need to medicate. You need to use antibiotics. You know, you, obviously antibiotics don't work on viruses, but they do work very well against bacteria. So the typical approach is to, is to treat the animals appropriately based on the sensitivity data you get back from the diagnostic laboratory. What antibiotics mm -hmm. appear to be effective against the organisms that are recovered from the pigs. And these would be both oral and injectable? Yes, yes, both ways uh, injectable. Is, is probably the most efficacious way to treat an animal, but you're dealing oftentimes with 2,400 pigs, 4,800 pigs mm. that are sick. And so you oftentimes have to mass medicate for a short period of time to treat the population. Now, swine veterinarians, and for that matter, the whole pork industry, I think has a good reputation for using antibiotics responsibly. However, there are forces at work in the food chain that would like to see you eliminate antibiotics altogether. Um, is, is that doable, especially when we have diseases like PERS that open up the door to so many secondary infections? I don't think so. In health-challenged animals that really have, uh, that are clinically ill, they need an antibiotic treatment if it's a bacterial disease. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard for them to uh, fight it off by themselves. They need to be treated just like the dog needs to be treated or the baby needs to be treated. They need, they need medication too. So yeah, I don't think you can do it if you've got health challenge situations. Well, nevertheless, I understand that you recently conducted a study that you presented here at the Lehman Conference um, taking a look at PERS-infected animals in antibiotic-free situations. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the study? Yeah, it was a really neat project that we did with Zoetis, and they worked together with us on research projects, and this was a cooperative study we wanted to do together to demonstrate whether in health challenge situations are antibiotics appropriate, are they important, do they work? And so in our research facility, we set up uh, three groups of animals, two groups which received medication appropriately, and the other group which was antibiotic free, for example. They'd never received any medication from birth all the way through the growth, pe growth period, which was the plan. And, and, and excuse me, when you say they received medication, what type of medication? Sure. Uh, were they injectable, oral? Both, okay. yeah, both. Uh, it was, uh, they, we had a medication plan for the two groups, which were uh, the treatment groups, and then the control group was really the ABF group, or the antibiotic free group. And how old were the pigs? Well, they, it was started at birth all the way through uh, the marketing period, so it was a six-month trial. Yeah, and uh, to kind of understand the need for the antibiotic in the health challenge situation, we uh, kind of purposely infected a small subset of the pigs with PERS virus and let the virus kind of spread its way through the population like it would in a normal natural situation. And we learned within probably a week or two that the animals that were in the ABF group or the antibiotic-free group, the animals that were sick but we could not treat them with antibiotics, uh, suffered greatly. And we had, because of welfare reasons, we had to stop that study. Mm. We had to pull the plug and treat the entire group and put it back onto medication because the, the pigs were... Uh, Clearly, it was a welfare issue. It was, they were really suffering. 
And the and people, what specifically were you seeing? Oh gosh, we were seeing just high mortality levels. We were seeing a lot of weight loss, uh, pigs, you know, huddling and piling and just very feverish, very sick. Uh, this was a very aggressive challenge. And uh, yeah, the, and the other thing that was really interesting: the people taking care of the pigs also suffered emotional distress. Hmm. Yeah, they, 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 we, and we, we, we questioned them at times to kind of get their feelings about this and. And yet they were very concerned. They weren't able to treat these animals like they knew they needed to be treated. So it was, a, it was not only an animal issue, it was actually a human issue in the area of welfare. So what did you take away from all of this? And, and, and tell me about your presentation yesterday. Well, the, the main message was when pigs are sick, they need to be treated with antibiotics. I mean, you need antibiotics to treat bacterial diseases and we were recovering from these pigs many, many bacteria that were causing disease. So we had documented that here are the organisms involved in these sick animals, here are the medications that are effective against these bacteria, and when we finally were able to treat the antibiotic-free group, which no longer was antibiotic-free, they responded extremely well. I mean, they recovered, the welfare went up, the the people involved got excited again about taking care about those animals correctly. It was uh, such a turnaround in just the mood of the, the staff as well as the health of the population. It was it was fascinating. So they're good for morale. Yeah. Well, you gotta have, you gotta have it's a tool in the toolbox, and, and it's a tool you need at certain times. You don't we don't treat them every day. We treat them when they need to be treated. Mm -hmm. And we do it justified based on the fact, here's our diagnostic lab report, here's our sensitivity report, these are the drugs that will be effective, let's go apply them appropriately with the correct dose, the correct duration, and then let's pull them out. So, you know, they, we don't use them all the time. We simply use them when we need them. Yet, I'm sure that there would be some folks out there who would say, okay, you did the right thing, the pigs were sick, you treated them, but, you know, they never should have had that in the first place because of the way you raise pigs and what they perceive to be overcrowded conditions and so forth. Uh, maybe they should be outdoors in the sunshine. How do you respond to that as a veterinarian? All I know is it's much more welfarious to raise pigs in confined facilities that are properly designed and properly stocked where there's proper feed and water access, mm -hmm. there's protection from parasites, there's protection from wildlife. A lot of these pigs aren't bred to be outside. They're not built that way. Mm -hmm. They're built to be inside because that's how the genetics have been uh, raised over time. And that's where they are the most safe, that's where they're, they're the happiest, that's where they're the most welfarious is when they're raised the right way. Now you can, over, you can make mistakes under those conditions and you can raise them improperly. And we don't approve of that whatsoever. But if you follow the rules and you give them space, fresh air, clean place to live, great source of water, properly designed nutrition program, those animals are, are happy, they're welfarious, and it's, that's how they want to live. So you've made a good argument for using antibiotics in, in pigs. Um, but still, there are, there's pressure to use them as responsibly as we can. Do you feel that we're doing that, or what could we be doing better? I think we've made great strides. I, I don't believe in the need to feed antibiotics continuously in the diet for the growth of the pig. And that's, that was a practice of the past. Mm -hmm. That's no longer uh, an opportunity. We can't do that anymore. We can use medication in the feed appropriately for a specific period of time, but the, the, the growth promotion, continuous feeding of medication, I don't agree with. And so what this has done for us is it's, I think, made us better stewards of antimicrobial use. Because you can't do that and you can't rely on that crutch, you have to become much more, bet, uh, you have to be improved in your management skills to set the facilities up correctly, to make the environment correct, to do everything you can to manage the welfare and the health of the animals so you don't need continuous feeding of medications. It's also allowed us to rely on veterinary prescription use of injectables and water solubles. That's really nice because now the veterinarian has a lot more input in how the medications will be used mm -hmm. and they have to be purchased through a veterinary clinic with a prescription. 
And so kind of like in a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So there's a much better record of how much use is actually going on in the industry. So some of, this, some of the feedback has been good. It's, it's made us better as far as how to properly manage the antimicrobial use. I think we're doing a better job now. One final question regarding antibiotics. Um, there have been a lot of changes in the poultry industry. I've seen one estimate that in 2017, uh, about 45% of the feed medic of the feed produced for poultry may not have an antibiotic in it. Um, is that a red flag for you in the pork industry, or is this something that, that you might aspire to? How do you how do you respond to that? Well, it's a lot easier in the poultry industry when you only have a sh very short, and the birds are born in eggs, and then and then they're only around for a short period of time. It's much more difficult when you've got a six-month growing period for or a pig to do that. So the no antibiotic ever claim to me, mm -hmm. based on this trial we did, showing the the, the welfare aspect of that trial showed me that, in my personal opinion, I'll never eat or consume or purchase a gram of meat that's got a no antibiotic ever label on it. I don't care. Because I, what I saw what happened to the animals that are in our study that were under the no antibiotic ever ABF group, I, to me it was unethical. So we need to treat animals when they get sick. And so if I see these no antibiotic ever labels, I wonder how many animals in the population died to get that meat to the grocery store, you know? Mm -hmm. So do people need to think about that. What was the loss? What was the suffering? What was the welfare aspects of that flock yeah. that led to, okay, now here's your chicken, you know? Hope it tastes good because it, it sure makes me mad to see mm -hmm. and to think about what could have happened in that flock what potential suffering could have happened to that flock of chickens just to deliver, there you go, there's your drumstick. And you talked about ethics. I mean, you and other veterinarians have taken an oath to protect the, the welfare of these animals, haven't you? Yes, that's, that's our job. Yeah, we, and we need antibiotics to do it. It's one of our most important tools. When used appropriately, it's very effective. And you just go in and you treat and you get out. You know, you do it responsibly. You treat the infection, you secure the disease, and you pull them out. So yeah, that's, they need to be used responsibly. So that's what that trial told me was if we didn't have that tool, the animals, the suffering in the, in the animal world would be extremely high. Well, Scott, as always, great insights and good advice as well. Thank you very much. You bet. We've been talking to Dr. Scott D. He is Director of Research at Pipestone Veterinary Services in Pipestone, Minnesota. Thank you again. My pleasure.